And just like that, Mike, we're live, brother. Don't do that to me. What? I can't hear you. Sorry, man. No audio. Audio check. We were running late because I had some technical difficulties with my microphone. Audio check. Audio check. One, two. Good morning, folks. If you can hear us. Nobody's on yet, but they soon will be, Mike, and this is a golden opportunity to talk to him about. My name is Rich Brown. I'm joined by Mr. Mike Seeklander, and we are your co-hosts of the American Warrior Show. Mike, what is that right there? Look at that. Looks like a coin of some sort. I'm not sure what that yeah. is. Is that a coin? That is a coin of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show. Look at that swag. Woo. Wow, nice. Where does the guy get all that fancy stuff? I don't have well, I don't have a, I don't have a coffee cup. I'm sitting here. I don't have a coffee cup. Click on the links, Mike. You can have one, pal. Mm. We have, you know, what's funny is uh, we've been doing this for six over six years now, and I don't think we've ever done a show on the plethora of self defense weapons. And if you could see my desk, it is I've got dozens of self defense weapons, and we're going to talk about them today. So it's a pretty awesome show. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the show. Hey, Rich, what pages are we live on? We just live on shooting performance in the American Warrior Society this morning. Just the American Warrior Society, man. Oh, interesting. Just one page. So we'll have like uh, eight viewers then this morning because people are all over the place, man. We got to wrangle them. We got we got to put this out there. We got to put the net out there, folks. So put the net out there. Share in all the groups, like every group on Facebook. If you do a favor, share it. Share, share it because we're talking about some cool stuff today. We're going to demystify some of these self-defense weapons and call them what they are, junk or not so bad, but you need to consider the context in which you use them. So we got uh, 13 folks joining us already. Mr. David Garrett, uh, Jeff Brown says, I have two brothers. Johnny King is on. Mr. Rudy is on. Will Parker. Hope everyone is well. Mike, can we talk about sponsors real quick? Which one do you want to lead with? Well, uh, let me mention Bob. Actually, if you look over my right shoulder, if you can see him okay in the camera, I've got my Bob behind me. That's the body opponent bag. Now, Bob is actually on top of a table because the base is pretty heavy. I didn't want to drag the base in here. But, man, I tell you, uh, there's lots of lots of good ways to get a workout, right? You know, we talk about, you know, fitness is, is a big part of winning a fight. Uh, but, man, why would you spend your time – on an elliptical or a bike or whatever else, if you could spend that same time getting your cardio training in, striking Bob and work on your strikes, work on your elbow strikes and your hand strikes, your closed fist strikes. And that's that's the advantage of having Bob. I, I prefer Bob over a heavy bag these days. Um, he's still heavy. He, you know, that when I when I make contact, if you don't own a Bob, if you make contact with his face and his body, it feels similar to actually a human target, a human head, human body. But the interesting thing about the Bob is I can target specific areas. So literally, Rich, you know, when I'm doing my knee strikes, I'm driving an arm in under the chin. I'm driving my arm into the same position that I would on a normal human. I'm doing all those same things in terms of targeting. I can do eye gouging. I can do all that cool, you know, uh, stuff that we might consider. But you can't do on a normal heavy bag. I love a normal heavy bag. I love a big, you know, banana bag that you can throw leg kicks on or whatever else, man. But the body opponent bag for me as a freestanding training tool is – the absolute cat's meow mountain. Yeah. Let's talk about precision holsters, man. Precision holsters, makers of the ultra appendix rig that I wear, as well as the fast system that Mr. Mike Seeklander wears. And I wear on the range as well. And Mike Seeklander also has his signature line of holsters from precision holsters. Tell us about that, Mike. Uh, well, I, if I had one here, I would show you one, but I didn't bring one this morning. Just get on precisionholsters.com and you'll see them on the front page. Signature line, Seeklander signature line. You can click on that link and see the variations. If you are looking for the defensive host, holster, the specific holster I carry, look at the Ultra Appendix. But, of course, there's also a secondary inside the waistband holster they make in the signature line, which is carried strong side. So depending on what you're looking for, you can look at both. And, then of course, the FAST, P-H-A-S-T, get it? Precision Holsters, A-S-T instead of FAST, uh, is also made in the signature line, which is kind of a cool, subdued, flag it's got the stars and stripes it's a really well-designed holster and in my personal opinion it looks fantastic 
It does look fantastic. Let me talk to you about apphemp.com and all of our sponsors, man. They're real easy to find. Just click on the link I'll put in today's show notes. Take you to AmericanWarriorShow.com. Right-hand side of the page, we've got links to all of our sponsors and all the deep discounts. Apphemp.com, makers of the finest CBD products money can buy. Gunnery Sergeant Jesse Ross and I were in the Marines together, and him and his family are growing amazing products. They do everything from propagation to product. So they got everything you need. Full spectrum CBD, folks. Helps you sleep, helps you think, and even helps your joints. So check them out. Who else we got, Mike? Man, did we talk about the Cool Fire Trainer? No. Talk so to us. if you didn't jump on the live stream last week, please go back and watch that video. We talked about some great stuff, or I should say last Wednesday, this last Wednesday. Uh, show the Cool Fire Trainer in the last several live streams we've done. If you think about Trend. Cool Fire Trend heard of it. A lot of you probably have a tool. You know, it's like uh, dry fire on steroids. You basically take your firearm, you replace the barrel, you replace the recoil spring. And roll. By the way, I think we're getting a little bit of internet lag, Rich. Yeah, you might want to turn your Wi-Fi off, Mike, if you haven't done so me already. okay and see me okay? Looks like the show is great. Hey, in the Mr. Mike Seeklander is having some trouble this morning, folks. Hopefully he'll get back with us in just a second. There he goes. He's spinning out. We'll give him just a second. Ah, oh, look at that. I'll we'll have to edit Mr. Mike out here in just a second. And let me go ahead and fix my camera so you don't have to see the gun cabinet back there. So we'll let Mr. Mike back in in just a second. Today's show is going to be on self-defense weapons. And hopefully uh, you guys are still with me. Jeff says I need to take full responsibility for that. Yeah. So while we're waiting for Mike to come back in the show, man, so today's show is on self-defense weapons, man. And I'll tell you, the first thing we're going to do is talk about winning the physical fight. Winning the physical fight is uh, really, there's several different ways we win a fight. And it looks like Mr. Mike is coming back on. So we'll pause there. Hey, folks. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, good morning. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what's going on. We've had a snowstorm recently, so it is what it is. Maybe I jump in, maybe I jump out, but I'm going to try to make this work. So can't control the internet. Now, did you turn all the Wi-Fi off there? It's been off. Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. We got some snow going on right now. I know a lot of folks that are watching this morning and having snow as well. You got snow over there, Mike? Uh, yeah, we've got nine inches of snow. Really? Looks like Mike has froze again, which is uh, which is really sad. Mike is froze again, which is a sad thing because man, we got a great show today. Like I said, you survive a fight a lot of different ways. You survive it physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, even. Are you ready for that? Financially, you survive. You survive it via loss of freedom. So that's the first thing we wanted to talk about this morning. I'm going to go ahead and let's see here. We'll take Mike off because that's an ugly picture of him. He would not want that there. <laughs> and he is out. So you don't want to win the physical fight only to lose your freedoms. You don't want to win the physical fight only to lose your house and your home and everything that you worked so hard for. Mike says, dude, my Wi-Fi is dropping. I'm trying to reset. So we'll get some of this stuff out of the way. Um, understand that a fight is nothing more than a violent clash of wills. And first, you got to win inside your opponent's mind for it to work. As we've talked about many times on the show, they have chosen you for predation. Uh, this was not up to you. And if, and if you were the instigator of the fight, shame on you. But more often than not, you have been chosen. So how do you counteract that? One of the more interesting ways I've I've heard it described is this. Some people carry these around in their pocket. Come on. 
which is an interesting idea. I don't think I would try that, but the idea is, is interesting, you know, that someone has marked you, they're picking a fight with you, and all of a sudden you go, yeah, let's do this. And put your mouthpiece in, uh, which, which hi highlights another part of, of warfare, and that is non-linearity. Non let's see if we can add Mr. Mike. There he is again. Sorry, <clears throat> not sure what's going on, man. I, we have a good morning, folks. We have a, a, an exposed internet cable. AT and T has not buried the cable in the backyard. And of course, we have eight inches of snow. I know a couple of you are from Oklahoma. We've had a bunch of weather. It's super cold out right now. So if I drop again, so uh, apologize, and I promise I'll make it up to you next week or the following week. So, Rich, let's drive on, and let's hope I can stay on. And if not, then uh, you can carry the show. Yeah. So what I was just talking about, Mike, you might find this interesting. I don't know if you ever saw it where somebody's marked you for a fight and thinking of the 30 folks that are bearing with us this morning. And, um, you know, they're, they've pushed you or they're confronting you and you all of a sudden pull out of your pocket and go, yeah, let's do it. Come on. I'll piece up. <laughs> yeah. Now, if somebody did that to me, I'd be like, I think I've miscalculated this. Somebody that carries around a mouthpiece in their pocket. And I knew a lot of uh, bouncers that did that carried a mouthpiece and that's like oh okay they're they're ready so that's one of those things we we're discussing non-linearity i want to change the paradigm with which you think a normal fight occurs and disrupt whatever uh thinking you had going on and that that goes back to what does winning a fight look like you know i want them to do something other than decide to fight me and some of these tools are going to help us do that this morning i got them splayed all over my desk mike and i guess we can get into the first thing is the body the human body, man, is a self-defense weapon. Let's talk about, well, I guess we'll start with the top. Talk about the head. Obviously, we've got the brain inside there that can help us with awareness and avoidance. If we understand the BAD acronym, we got the baseline for what normal society looks like. We add in a, an anomaly to that baseline, and suddenly we got to make a decision uh, to do something else or we're going to be in the fight. So, But beyond that, the brain and the mind, we also have the head as a grappling tool, right? Absolutely, man. You know, so I think a lot of folks uh, misinterpret that and think of the head as just as a head striking tool. But, you know, if you if you go to any BJJ place or large MMA facility or training hall, you'll find all of these wrestlers with big cauliflower ears and BJJ guys. And the wrestlers tend to tend to have, I think, more cauliflower ears than you will see that in the BJJ community. And a lot of that is because they're not just striking with their head, but they're utilizing their head and their neck to drive and control things. You know, you know, one of the things that you need to understand in a fight is if someone controls your head, they probably control you. So think about that in reverse. If you learn to control someone's head, you probably control them. And, uh, you know, you, you see the ears because of how they're driving their face and the side of their head into, into their opponent beyond just head strikes. The head is an incredibly important tool. It's also one of the reasons, you know, as Rich knows, and, and most of you may have known, that Mr. You know, Mike Bruce, one of our buddies, Mike the Machine Bruce, works his neck so much because the neck is directly attached to the head and attached to the body. So the more neck strength you have, the more effective you're going to be able to control it. So that the head is huge in terms of understanding how to truly win a fight uh, or dominate your opponent. Yeah, and, and a lot of people, I, I've heard some of my jiu-jitsu coaches refer to like their chest as their chest hand, because you use your your chest as a as another appendage to grab with. You can use your head to help secure a, a, an arm bar or something like that. So the head beyond just the brain housing group is an, is part of the integral system. And like you said, another thing is I've heard of if you put the head, if I have someone's head and I put it below my baseline, they can't. It's hard for them to really launch an attack on me. Of course, they can try for a single or a double leg, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the legs, man. Uh, the legs, obviously, you can strike with the legs, which I know you know a lot about, Mike, and you're going to be telling us about some of the stuff you can do with your feet, with your shins, with your knees. Uh, but you can also use it to GTFO, man. Get the effing heck out of there with your legs, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, Rich, we'll talk about some some leg strikes and maybe my background in leg kicks here in a second. Um if you're not, uh, if you haven't sh liked and shared, please like and share the show. We apologize for the delay getting on, and then me dropping a couple times. It's the internet; I can't control that. So sorry. This has kind of been a little bit of a shoddy show this morning. Not what Rich and I normally do, as you as you well know. But we do have kind of an interesting question, Rich. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll have you answer it because you're wearing glasses right now. Robert mm -hmm. Davies uh, asked, good morning. What do you do when your glasses with the fight's about to start? So Rich, man, if you're about to tangle, get up in the foot, the fouled up tangle, what do you, what, I don't wear glasses full time. So what would, what do you do with your glasses? Uh, you know, they're, they're probably coming off cause I don't need them. They're, they just help me read the top part of the glasses are just clear. It's just the bifocals that I use to read. So they're coming off and I, and I do work, you know, when I grapple in the dojo, I don't have glasses on, so I don't, I certainly don't need them. Yeah, I completely agree, Robert. I, I would say that's one of the first things you're going to want to remove is glasses because you know, granted, if you end up in that contact situation, depending on how bad your eyes are, you probably don't need your eyes to see the fists or whatever clearly to control your opponent. A lot of what you're going to be doing is by feel. So uh, keeping those glasses on is going to be an issue because if someone throws a punch or an elbow or whatever else, you not just eat their fist or their elbow, but now you, know, you have the frame of your glasses or the lens or whatever else. And the interesting counter to that is if we're talking about removing glasses or removing hats or removing different things, you know, that's one of the things we talk about in terms of, you know, facial grooming and, and posturing when you're about to get into a fight. When, when you see someone st take their glasses off, you know, take their hat off, do different things, take their necklace off, the necklace, they don't want to get ripped off the throat. Those are things that will probably show you that someone you're about to fight is, is serious about that. But on to um, legs, you know, leg kicks. One of the things that the, some of you may or may not know is the first martial art I start out with is... Uh, Okinawan freestyle karate. Tommy Mossman in Jacksonville, North Carolina, had a small plywood wall dojo. And the reason the, the walls were all plywood was because all of the, the sheetrock had been kicked in and kicked off from bodies flying into the sheetrock. And he was uh, originally an Ishin Ru guy, and he, he changed that system to what he called Okinawan freestyle karate, which is a bare knuckle, full contact system, much like if you look at the Sabaki Challenge or whatever else. He incorporated elbows and knees and uh, very, 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 very vicious, difficult uh, uh, Muay Thai style, style leg kicking. And that's what I learned. That I learned that from the very beginning of you know my training there. And I learned to throw a leg kick. And I spent literally hours and hours and hours throwing leg kicks. And, you know, as Rich will attest, I had the ability to throw a leg kick that was, was so devastating it's at one point that when I sparred with other folks in the dojo, Tommy wouldn't allow me to throw leg kicks. Um, of course, I paid the price 20 years later with two hip replacements, maybe from throwing full power kicks into the banana bag. Uh, but leg kicks are, are incredibly devastating. You know, we used to say, you know, Tommy's Tommy's rules were if you can't, if your opponent can't stand, they can't fight. If they can't breathe, they can't fight. If they can't see, they can't fight. So those really truly ring true if you think about those three things. And can't stand, can't fight. That directly related to you know a, a leg kick. By the way. Rich, I don't know if we'll post a link today because we're kind of beyond, uh, technologically challenged, but Rich and I are putting together a, a small, what we call how to win a fight challenge. It's going to be a five-day challenge. Man, that is a rough picture, Mike. I don't, I don't know if you guys can see that. <laughs> this is good stuff. The magic of live TV. I'm going to give him a second to come back on that. That, that picture of Mike is pretty rough guys. <laughs> uh, love it. That is a rough picture, man. Yeah. Johnny King says, Oh, he would not like that. Uh, no salon quality hair. No, no, sadly not. I knew Mike when he had a luscious set of hair. It was absolutely breathtaking. So we'll give him a second to come back on. Uh, before we get going any further, what kind of questions are you guys going to have? Just as a screenshot that. Yeah, Ooh, that was rough. Which can Bob XL take nine millimeter rounds? Yeah, the question that Jesse has is can Bob take nine mil rounds? Absolutely. Bob loves to eat those nine mil rounds. I, I have stabbed Bob before. I wouldn't recommend that. That. Uh, especially if you do a slash on Bob, that's it's a permanent thing. But the the nine mil and five five six, all day long. I haven't shot Bob with a shotgun yet. Uh, I don't know that that would be good, especially if you hit the base of Bob, which is inside there. So we're waiting for Mike to jump back on. Hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions you're going to have about self defense weapons? 
Uh, Gerald says proper kick demand on the AWS site. Yeah. Is there a proper kick demo on today AWS site? Yeah, there actually is. But also I put in today's show notes, there's a video of Boss Rutan, the king of Pancrase, if you're not familiar with who Boss Rutan is. And one of the things I like about Boss is how he uses, uh, and of course, I think this was the rules of Pancrase at the time. He uses hill palm strikes to the face and then closed fists to the body which is very similar to Kyoko Shinkai or Okinawan freestyle. It's full contact from the clavicles down and the head is, uh, is for open palms only, but watch how boss uses his kicks. Watch how boss uses his hands. His grappling is very rudimentary, but very effective. He's not reinventing the wheel. It's there's a lot of uh, guillotines, uh, just one or two submissions to the ground, but I really like watching boss fight because he's one of the few guys and most of his knockouts come from closed fist punches to the liver. And I mean, those you watch the guys writhe in pain. So check out the link in today's show notes for uh, how boss does it. Let's see. I've got a text from Mr. Seeklander here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and run with it. Micah's internet is completely down, which is a shame. So we'll talk through some of these things quickly. So as far as using the body, we've got the head. We've got the legs. We can GTFO and get the heck out of there. We can use them to strike. We can use our arms. We can use... I prefer not to use closed fist punches for the reason that I need my hands to grapple with. And if I break a hand and I've done that, hand swells up. And I'm completely out of the fight. So I need those hands to grapple. So probably not going to be doing any closed fist punching. The last thing that the body can do is Kazushi. And Kazushi, who can tell me what Kazushi means? Kazushi is off balancing. Off balancing. I want to use my body in such a way to off balance my opponent. Because one of the things that I definitely want to do is I want to use the terrain as a weapon. And that's the, that's the second part after the body. I want to use the terrain as something that can help me win this physical fight. It is a self-defense tool. I'm going to use gravity to plant a human being in the ground. I'm going to use obstacles, whether that's doors or shopping carts, uh, trees. I mean, we had a video on here the other day of a lawyer getting shot at uh, a very close range, like literally one to two feet. And he's using the tree to as a really excellent piece of cover. And he survived the fight when the guy ran out of ammo. But they're, they're one to two feet away, and that lawyer was able to save himself simply by putting an obstacle in between him and his attacker. A street or lamp pole. I can use this obstacle as cover or concealment. Uh, I can use it to create time or distance between me and somebody else. So um, another thing I like about putting an obstacle between me and, the, and my opponent is if they have to maneuver around it, it shows clear intent that they are pursuing me beyond what I have tried to put in front of them. It also shows that I was trying to, to de-escalate and get away from the attacker. Another thing that uh, a lot of people don't want to hear is that the vehicles are just a piece of terrain in your environment. Uh, there's a lot of vehicle CQB stuff out there. Some of it's really outstanding. Some of it is not. Um, I won't go into who's teaching good stuff and who's not, but don't get caught up in the vehicle's got 16 points of cover. This is the A pillar, B pillar, and all this other stuff. It's just a piece of terrain. Treat it like that. It's not the end all be all. Um, so that is really all I wanted to talk about with regard to using terrain as a weapon. So we've talked about the body. We've talked about terrain. Let's actually get into some of uh, the actual tools here. First thing is a light. And just like that, you can have blinding light on demand. Mr. Seeklander is still texting me. Let's see what he's saying here. Oh, he's showing me pictures of snow. Another thing is this. In my bedroom, I keep this guy. And I think it's like maybe one million lumens. It's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. These two pieces of kit, uh, some pepper spray gel and a flashlight are right next to uh, my bedroom. So that's my less lethal light as a self-defense tool is very interesting and very effective. You can carry your light on a plane. Actually, this is the one that I use when I fly and it goes in my pocket. You can imagine that 
Uh, it has the ability to strike. It has a crenulated bezel. So these products from Streamlight, Streamlight sent us this gear, I believe. So shout out to them. Then you have this product from Saber Red, which is actually a light and pepper spray, which is a pretty, pretty, really cool uh, thing. I don't really like where they put the button at on this for the light, but it does have a light. And it does have the pepper spray on it. And it has a really cool clip. Big fan of that. And Saber Red products as well. So the lights is a is an, a really amazing tool. And hopefully you guys are carrying all those. Let's see what uh, comments we got here. Johnny says, what areas of the body would you target on a drugged attacker? Hmm, that is a really good question. You know, I... I think that it's an attacker, whether they're drugged, whether they're a little old lady, whether they're a, a five-year-old girl or a you know, 250-pound biker. Um, when I was a close combat instructor, the, um, the lead instructor, Sergeant Keyhole, said, I don't care if it's a little old lady or, or another Marine. They're, if they want to buy a ticket, they're going to get to ride the, all the rides. And what he went, what he meant was, uh, eloquently it's, it's Sun Tzu, man, you know, never underestimate your opponent. So whether they're drugged or not drugged, and I think his, his point, and I'm not, I don't want to brush it off because he's right. When you're dealing with someone that's under the influence of drugs or alcohol, uh, they, they have diminished capacity for pain and it's going to take perhaps a, a higher level of force to, to deescalate this person. Also, they're not thinking correctly. So, and, and we will, plow through some of this some of the gadgets i have on my desk are going to be really good for those guys and we'll talk about them as we get to them let's see jeff says there is a story years ago about an individual reading a newspaper when a robber shot at him he held up the newspaper and ducked the robber shot where he was and missed three rounds concealment works yeah chuck uh bill says chuck haggard and most of the guys who teach oc regularly say to avoid the jail oc because it takes longer to affect the opponent yeah bill bill's question is really good so bill's talking about this jail i'm not a big fan of jail either not at all but let me let me tell you where jail shines jail was designed for hospital environments because it doesn't aerolize and it in the small particles of oc doesn't go throughout the hospital's ventilation system and hurt someone who's system is already compromised. So that's why I use this. It's for my home. If I have had to pepper spray someone in my home, that's what this is for. So that my family is not hurt or incapacitated by the, by the, uh, by the pepper spray. So Chuck Haggard is right. I don't like it. I've never used pepper gel on anyone. Uh, but this stuff is pretty amazing. If you look online, it's, it shoots like 25 to 30 feet away. And when it hits their face, you can see when people have been shot by it, it, it literally rocks their head back. So that's a good thing. Kyle says, people always ask me why I carry a flashlight when your cell phone has a light. I just do what Rich does, flash the light in their faces, then they get the point. You know, what's interesting, I hear that I hear that too. And I find that so uh, strange because I need to be communicating with my, with my uh, phone and using the light to, to, to shine a path. And that happens more often than not. Or I need to see something as I communicate. It's people that do that. It's, it's you, you, they don't get it. Uh, Jesse says, I believe that the quote translate to these hands are rated E for everyone. That's yeah, it's interesting. But I, I can't emphasize enough, unless you're a trained striker, you're probably going to damage your hand striking an opponent. And that's that's where stuff like this comes in as a force multiplier. These are some uh, Oakley gloves. I carry them in my go bag if I need them to, to pick up uh, broken glass or, or other pieces of debris. This is something that can really help with that. They're leather, but they also have the knuckle protectors on them. Guess what? I fly with these. They're in my pack. So if I were in a non-permissive environment and need to put these on because I needed to get after it, I certainly could do that. Uh, let's see. Tony says, if you use spray, expect to be affected by it in some manner. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Now, of course, you you won't get one-fifth, or let me back that up. You won't get probably 5 to 10% of what the attacker is going to get, but especially if you spray hit him or her and then you move in, 
after the spray is is just gone out in order to restrain them. I saw this a lot as a police officer and a corrections officer. I would spray someone and it doesn't take but a second or two to let that mist go on them, settle and then move in. But if you spray and rush in, then yeah, you're going to eat it. Like Tony says, Bill says separate light is the only way to go. Light on the cell phone is limited. Chad says people who think their cell phone is a flashlight don't understand the context of why you need a standalone flashlight. Yeah, he's absolutely true. So we talked about lights. Let's talk about less lethal. I uh, introduced the conversation of less lethal. We're talking about the pepper spray, but you know, you got to understand that pepper spray could be lethal. All these, all these tools we're going to talk about has the potentiality for you're using force on somebody. You could shove someone as we saw, uh, you know, the police officers do at a BLM riot back in 2020, I believe they pushed an old man, the old man fell, hit his head and he died. And, and that's an unfortunate thing, but it happens. So any use of force on, on another human being has the potentiality to be lethal. Of course, you can always say, well, that wasn't my intent. And if there's video, it may show that clearly that was not your intent, but please understand using force on someone is inherently risky to your, uh, to you. Or as attorney Andrew Bronco always says, you have a greater than zero degree chance of death or spending the rest of your life in prison. But let's talk about this. Saber Red is an amazing product. We just talked about it right here. Uh, some of the things that I like is a stream. I like these kind of safeties on it. It's easy to put my thumb in it. When I put my thumb in it, I always know the orientation of where the spray is going to come from. Some of the ones that twist. You don't always know where the nozzle is pointing. I love Sabre Red. I carry Sabre Red. My daughters, I've given them Sabre Red. But for Rich Brown, I use Mean Green or some of the other Fox Lab products. They make a clear pepper spray as well. Now, the reason for that is there's a great um, video floating around the interwebs. Police officers spray. A, uh, we understand we live in a very charged time right now understand the context and the lens with which people are watching your use of force. And uh, they take the suspect and they spray him with pepper spray. They put him in handcuffs. It's a non-event. However, under the street lamp, the saber red products dripping off this African-American male's face appears to be blood. And the community that has gathered to watch the police do their job now think that the suspect has been battered and bloodied. And that's not the case which is why I like green. Green can never be mistaken for blood. Another thing, if I pepper spray someone with a, with a red product and it's on their face or on their body, it may confuse EMS that the person is, is or has been bleeding. So I like clear or green to get away from that. So that's the first less, less lethal I want to talk about. There's also tasers and taser lights. I've never used a taser, folks, professionally or otherwise. So I can't really speak to that. I own one. It's on my wife's nightside table. It's a light and a, and a, uh, and a stun gun, but I didn't bring it this morning. Cause I, I just don't know enough about them. I've never been certain. Whereas I've been certified on most of the stuff we're talking about this morning, never have been certified on the taser. So I have uh, obviously been certified on pepper spray and I've actually used this, not this product, but uh, the old mace, CN and uh, it was CN and CS in a can with an aerosol that pushed the product out, which I guess we might as well talk about that. Be careful of the uh, when you buy these products to make sure that's a water based uh, aerosolant. Is that how you say that? That's actually pushing the product out because you could have someone catch on fire if another officer tasers them. That could be bad. So we don't want that to happen. Um, Excellent products. I, I believe in pepper spray 100%. I think it's a great equalizer. Remember, if using some of these tools today and it, it does go to court, they can always say, you know, this is aggravated assault. With pepper spray, it's as I understand it, it's always going to be uh, simple assault. And Tony says, yeah, I know the five elements of self-defense. Jeff, my brother, says freeze plus P. That's what we use when Jeff and I were with the Knox County Sheriff's Department. It's amazing product because it has, it's a little bit of everything. It's got CN in it, CS, as well as OC spray. It's clear. It's a stream. It is awesome. It is a 
ass kicking in a can. Thank you to the 28 folks still joining us. Kyle says, I should consider Sabre Red. I just hope it's available in the Philippines. Yeah, I hope it is too, because uh, it's good stuff. And let's see, uh, Bill says Palm works pretty well as well. I know that John Korea speaks highly of it, so and I, I like John. He's a good friend. So if he says it works, then I'll, I'll take his word for it. Matt says the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, you hit someone with pepper spray, they're, they're going to experience it for the next couple of days, especially every time they get in the shower for the next 24 to 48 hours, they're going to remember you. And the other thing we need to remember about this stuff is it has an ultraviolet marking dye. So even if they are able to wash the green off their face, um, a black light that law enforcement could use will light up that person's face and they're going to know who did it, which is another hidden benefit. You know, I don't have a Cubiton here. I guess you could use just about anything you wanted for that, whether that's something like this, very innocuous, but I can use it for pressure point strikes. Um, I was a big fan of PPCT when it first came out back in the 90s. Uh, PPCT is pressure point control tactics. A lot of people say they don't work. They're, they're bunk. You got to understand the context in which they're being used. And in those regards, the older versions of it was pretty, pretty stout stuff. And it, and it can work if, if applied correctly. Let's talk about impact batons and whips. First of all, I guess we'll get the whips out of the way. This was sent to me by the inventor of this. It's got a clip on it. Uh, I, you could slide this down your trousers, and when you pull it out, uh, it just rides down there, no problem. It's got a little metal tip on it. This thing is vicious. Uh, I worked with it on Bob. What's interesting about this is this gentleman that, that created this, and I, I think it's called, let's see, the Fast Strike. What's interesting about this thing is uh, it's not classified as an impact weapon. It's actually classified as a whip. And you can actually, per the TSA, carry whips onto an aircraft. I've never tried to carry it onto an aircraft. I don't know if anybody else has tried to carry it onto an aircraft. Uh, it's an interesting idea. The problem that I have with a lot of these weapons are we need to understand how the weapon works how this weapon works for example pepper spray this weapon this weapon works by attacking the eyes nose mouth the mucous membranes that's why it's not going to work i've heard police officers say oh that pepper spray is crap rich you told me it works and it, it don't guys and then i go and i see the suspect and he's got a little bit of redness on his neck you miss the you miss this. This is your target for pepper spray. You spray him on the hands with this, it's not going to hurt, except when he goes to the bathroom. So you have to use it correctly, understanding how these things work. The whip and the impact weapons only are going to work through pain compliance or some sort of neurological knockout, you know, rendering them unconscious, which again, if this goes bad for you in court, guess what? That's all bad because you put the client... Uh, unconscious. That is all bad. So we have uh, beyond the whips, we have a PR 24. I think it's called a personal restraint device, 24 inches. It's 5,000 pound tensile strength. It's made out of virgin nylon, which is why I like this as, a, as opposed to an ASP baton. Uh, of course, I'm certified on both. They both have their merits but one is named after a snake. It's black, it's metal, it's scary. This is made out of virgin nylon and it's not designed to hit anybody. It's actually made to res restrain people, so it says. Um, lots of use for this if you know what you're doing with it. Personally, I never hit anybody with them. I've seen other officers hit, hit folks with it. It didn't seem to work. It didn't seem to take the fight out of them. If you're not communicating clearly to the attacker or to your suspect, what you want them to do, they just feel like you're kicking the shit out of them for no reason. Let's be honest. And they're just going to force them to fight harder. So um, please understand that when you're dealing with impact weapons. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, I do have one other impact weapon. Let's see here. Where is that? This is the one that really upsets a lot of people. I'm going to go ahead and pull it out here. The old blackjack. Uh, my brother Jeff, who's on here this morning, will recognize this. This was our, our grandfather's blackjack. Uh, and somehow I am the, it's custodian now. It's, it, these are pretty pretty awesome if you're not familiar with them. It's a lead weight with a, um, with a spring. It's easy to conceal. You can actually, and this is very important, by the way, 
put your hand through this thing. And I recommend this for any impact weapon that you'd be able to retain custody of it because the last thing you want to do with your impact weapon is to have it used on you and it's taken away from you. The reason I, I know my good friend Cecil Birch loves these over at Immediate Action Combatives. He's a third or fourth degree black belt. I'm taking his seminar in April. Love Cecil. He, he loves saps and blackjacks. The concern I have with them is, it's just like I said, how do these weapons work? Well, they work by by damaging your opponent. You know, if I smack you in the head with that, what am I, what kind of damage am I going to cause to get you to stop fighting me? Well, I'm probably going to bust your orbital bone or I'm going to uh, give you a brain bleed or, or concuss you to an extent where you stop fighting. Well, if I've concussed you bad enough where you're no longer fighting, you may suffer long-term harm. Now you can say, well, Rich, I don't care. Well, remember, if you're striking someone with a blackjack in the head, you're at lethal force. You might as well shoot him in the face. You have crossed the boundary into lethal force. It is not a less lethal weapon at this point. It is being used uh, in a deadly capacity. So please think about that. Thank you to the 34 folks watching us. Let's see what comments they have here. Uh, let's see here. Guile says... Um, Goss says with a pepper spray stain, Bob. Yes, he, it will. Bill says any weapon you utilize needs to be used in the manner it was uh, built for as to be effective. Yeah, totally correct, Bill. Goss says, to be honest, a lot of people don't understand the importance of simple things that we bring. It can save someone's life and your own flashlight, pocket knife. Yeah, we're going to talk about all that stuff. Excellent points. Jeff says pepper spray can be less effective on an individual whose diet consists of high quantities of pepper. Yeah. My brother who just made that quote, uh, I I've seen him eat a lot of pepper spray and take on a lot of CS when we were in the Marine Corps together. Yeah. The guy could actually eat CS grenades. It was hilarious. Bill says, does not mean you can't get creative and it still work? LOL. Yeah. Good morning, Jay. Jay uh, is uh out there in Hawaii. Good to have you on. I'm going to be talking about some things that I learned from Jay here in just a moment. So I'm glad you're on this morning. God says even a pen is a good self-defense. Well, yeah, absolutely. When I was a police officer, so much, some drunk doesn't want to get out of his car. I would pull my pen out and give them a lesson on pressure point control tactics and remove them from the car. And guess what? I didn't have to strike them. If you were videotaping me, you'd be like, wow, that, that officer was pretty nice. He slowly took his pen out. Next thing you know, the gentleman is just sliding right on out of that car. Bill says, saps jacks work really well, but have to be careful since they are illegal in some states. Johnny King says, brass knuckles are devastating. And let's go ahead and talk about brass knuckles because I actually ha have a pair right here. Um, yeah, devastating. I work uh, with, I strike Bob with these. You know, obviously you need to make sure you have a really tight fist or, or they will damage your hand. But I find that if you're striking at about 50%, of your speed and impact pressure and you're gripping the brass knuckles hard enough. I haven't ever had any issue with my hand. Now, again, if I'm striking someone in the head with these, please understand that's deadly force. I'm striking someone in the head with a pair of, with a blackjack or a sap deadly force. I know people don't want to hear that. It's deadly force. Now you can use your sap. If someone's grabbing you to strike the knuckles, things of that nature. That's fun. But, uh, yeah, that's a problem. Also, let's talk about this when it comes to striking people. Like I said, with a blackjack, I, I like to have it in a way where it can't come off. And I'll, I'll jump to this. This is something I carry in my truck in my toolkit, which is in the back seat. Now, I have this on here because if I have to use it, I don't want to lose it. And if I have to use a ball peen hammer on somebody, it is 100% deadly force. Or I can use it as it is designed as a hammer. But you got to think ahead. It didn't come with a piece of 550 cord on it, but I put it on there. Because if I'm swinging something, let's talk about this real quick. If I'm using this as a self-defense tool or my, my blackjack or whatever, I don't want to... I don't want to lose it. I've mentioned that. But the other thing is, when I strike with a, with a one-handed weapon, I want to do damage i want to do harm even if they try to block it i want them to be uh, devastated by it 
So with a hammer or a machete or something like that, even if they put their hands up to block it, I'm, I'm still doing damage. So think, consider that, please. Which is talking about now at this point, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're talking about improvised weapons, whether that's the hammer. I know Jay is, is working on a lot of uh, Jay Fujimoto out there in Hawaii. He's doing a lot of stick fighting lately. You can carry a cane. This is something that uh, I like to go to the UK with my family. Everything's a weapon in the UK and they're afraid of everything. But an, a 53-year-old man like myself walking down the street with a cane probably wouldn't raise a whole lot of eyebrows. Another thing that Jay turned me on to, and this isn't one, Jay, but um, it's I got the idea from uh, Jay Fujimoto, another one, and that is they make a self-defense umbrella. It's a, a, a undestructible umbrella, amazing tool. And again, very innocuous, but if you know how to use it as an impact weapon, it looks like any other umbrella, but it is it's a, it is incredibly well, well made and you can, you can use it incredibly effectively. While we are... are Let's see what other comments we have on our thank you to the 32 folks joining me here. God says, I have a dumb question. Will Axe body spray work for a defensive situation? You know, it's, it's not a dumb question, man. Let's take, let's take, let's take that question on. There's a lot of self-defense myths out there and I'll give you a couple. When I was a rad instructor, rape aggression, defense system instructor, uh, I, me and two female officers, we ran a multi-agency, uh, training team we went around and trained women on self-defense and a lot of them would say yeah my old self-defense instructor rich he told me to take my keys and wad them up in my hands like this rich and then i can punch somebody i'm like well please don't try that please don't try that you're going to damage your hand hit bob one time just as lightly tap him with a wad of keys in your hand and let me know how that works out for you and have the ice standing by in the motron because it's going to mess you up I was on a podcast probably a year or two ago and uh, it, these women were interviewing me and they had women calling in asking the self-defense guy questions. And one of them was, Rich, uh, I don't carry pepper spray. I, I carry wasp spray in my car and in my home. And I'm like, don't do that. Wasp spray, actually, the um, the chemical in it that is a that kills wasp is, is toxic to human beings too. So you're spraying someone with a toxic substance and that could elevate what you've done from simple assault by use of pepper spray, which is designed for it's designed for use on human beings. Whereas wasp spray is not, and it also could be flammable. So there's a lot of myths rolling around out there. You don't if all you have is axe body spray because you live in a country where you cannot use it, like in the UK, you can't use pepper spray. Pepper spray will get you 10 years. I know it used to be illegal in Chicago. I don't believe it is anymore. So in those instances where you can't, they make this stuff called Faber marking dye. It looks like a can of pepper spray, but it emits a water-based um, a water-based staining dye. But it's so viscous, it absolutely it can keep you from seeing. So it's an interesting solution for places where you're completely unarmed. So all I'm doing is squirting them with a water-based marking dye and that's it. They, their eyes won't sting. It won't burn. It won't hurt them, but their face will be red for weeks and weeks to come. So it's, it's vicious stuff. Hopefully that works. Gerald says, can you put a link in for the umbrella? Yeah. Hopefully Jay is still on. Okay. There he goes. He's put a link there. The unbreakable umbrella.com. Thank you, Jay. Bill says, depends on the weapon and where you are striking. I'm not sure what you're referring to bill unless you're talking about uh yeah yeah how you using the weapon I'll, I'll give you another example of perhaps what bill's talking about these weapons are laying all around the place man they're called rocks <laughs> and human beings have been using these to to get what they want for a long time so improvised weapons you always have potentially have a rock laying around you see it's sand is falling off of it yeah, there was one time I had um, I was getting attacked walking down an alleyway in the Philippines, Kyle. I was um, outside of Subic City in what we called the barrio. I don't remember what actual was. And three guys come up behind me. I saw a broken cinder block laying there. I grabbed it and, you know, kind of chased after him, screamed at him. And, and uh, I don't know if I said uh, in Tagalog, if I was speaking in Tagalog to him at the time. But, yeah, they, those three dudes ran off because uh, – they had, they had miscalculated the situation, evidently. Tony says, Bill Armstrong, PPCT 
designates the area to strike. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Jeff Day says, good morning, brother. Good morning, Jeff. Got 36 folks on. We are talking about self-defense self weapons. We've covered, we've covered how to use the body as a self-defense weapon. We talked about how to use lights as a self-defense weapon. We talked about how to use terrain as a self-defense weapon. Now we're talking about, we talked about less lethal things such as tasers, pepper spray, impact weapons, whips, etc. We talked about it's important to understand how the weapon is used and to use it in uh, the way, hopefully, that it's intended. We talked about if you're going to use a one-handed weapon, you want to be able to, number one, maintain control of the weapon, and number two, you want to have an impact weapon that does damage even when they are blocking or attempting to block that shot. Now we're talking about improvised weapons. We've talked about canes, umbrellas, rocks, bottles, trash can lids makes a great defensive tool if you if you can still find one. We talked about the hammer, chairs, sticks, broom handles, etc. You actually could use your keys, but not perhaps in the way that I mentioned earlier. You could if, if you wanted to flail with these things, you know, like that. I mean, that that could certainly work. But I definitely would not put them in my hand and make a closed fist and punch somebody. Talked about brass knuckles. Now, what's interesting about this is this right here will send you to prison in most jurisdictions. So if you're going to use the old brass knuckle trick, uh, if you when you buy these things, make sure that you buy them when they sell it as a belt buckle. And you can put this little belt buckle piece on here. Now, man, it's a belt buckle, bro. That's all it is. Another thing is it doesn't have to be made out of metal. Matter of fact, I would rather it have been made out of carbon fiber or some sort of polymer because I think that would probably be a better solution for that. So let's see. We got a couple more improvised weapons. I want to talk about the belt. It can be used as an improvised weapon. Just a standard, uh, strong, hard leather gun belt it can be used in a variety of ways. Here's one of the ones that I've used a lot. And that's the old bandana and a lock. Learned this from uh, Dr. T.C. Fuller, former FBI agent. And that is, I carry this on all the airplanes I'm on. Tie this thing off at the top. You got a great weapon. Put this lock in a sock. We've all heard about this from prisons and such. The old lock in a sock works fantastically well. Uh, actually, uh, my wife and I were in Rome back in 2019 on a little vacation. Of course, you can't go armed. You can't have knives. You can't have anything in, Ro in Rome. And I spent the night because we were in a really janky hotel before our flight the next morning. And I slept with with this, a lock and a, and a bandana. Literally slept with it under my pillow. Yeah. It was very sketchy, folks. So we talked about uh, a couple other improvised weapons. I've mentioned this one before. Big fan of this. The old Glock lock that you can get with, comes standard with every Glock that you buy. You can use it like this. I fly with this this thing every single time I fly. It's in my go bag. I'll show you another little interesting thing that these locks do when it comes to improvised weapons. And that is, I, I mentioned the fast strike a moment ago as, an, as a whip. Guess what this is? The same thing. It's got a metal tip, and it's it's orange, folks, so it's not scary. TSA, don't freak out on this. And it's an amazing little tool. It could be a sap or blackjack, however you want to call that. I have another little tool here. Let me might as well talk about. I don't sure where it fits in on the spectrum, but uh, I kind of like it. This right here is the SRT, the Survival Rescue Tool. Let me get a look at that. You pick these up for about $60 or $70, it's a little rescue tool. They're supposed to be TSA compliant, as you can imagine. This is how it looks when it's being utilized in this manner. And again, this is called the, let's see here, survival rescue tool. It has a lot of really cool gadgets on it. It's got a pocket clip on it. You just pull it straight out. And you can go to work with it. I have not flown with this yet. I I just got it uh, in the last six months or so. There's a couple of things I do not like about this. One is this curvature here to protect your hand from the glass breaker and stuff like that. It gets tends to get snagged on the pocket coming out. So the verdict's not out with this, but it 
has a bottle opener on it, seat belt cutter. It has a lot of really cool tools, glass breaker, interesting little rescue tool that can also double as a self-defense tool, allegedly TSA compliant. That remains to be seen. Let's see if we have any questions. Johnny Key says, look up prison weapons. They can make anything deadly. Yeah. And Johnny, of course, uh, my, uh, I worked in a prison, as did my brother who's on this morning. You're absolutely right. And um, that's one of the first things you learn, man. These, these uh, inmates are very, very clever. Let's talk about lethal tools. And before I go there, I'll show you guys something you've probably seen before. This is my bump in a night belt. And it's got uh, all my kit on it. Well, what's important about that is obviously it's a place to keep my gun, but it's also it gives me self-defense options on there. Um, everything from pepper spray to lights, uh, everything is on that that belt. I've, I've, I've already done a video on it before if you want to go into uh, our YouTube channel. In the link to there, I tell you how I set it up, why I set it up, what I have on there, et cetera. So I won't go into it, but understand that lethal rifle shotguns are amazing. Um, shotguns are versatile because of baton rounds, which is the rubber bullets. When we had uh, Manhar from South Africa, he talked about the the amazing utility of being able to use less lethal rubber bullets on tens of thousands of people that were trying to invade his community. They worked really well. And for those that didn't work, uh, there was someone providing overwatch with five, five, six, that were able to engage those targets. So they were caught in a hellish situation. So I won't go into rifles and handguns. We all understand those. I think people that are watching this morning, but let, I want to talk about edge weapons briefly because they're lethal men. There's no context in which uh, using an edge weapon is not lethal. There's the sock P. If you're not familiar with that, it's an amazing little tool. If I was still rocking a plate carrier, I'm not. I'm an old retired guy. I would probably have one of these on my plate carrier. It's a great little tool, the sock P dagger. Uh, here's a variety of knives that I carry on a daily basis. This one right here, it's... Um, What's the name of this thing? It's the K-Bar TDI and works. Uh, Shane Hippel over there at works made me this little rig. I carry, carry it concealed. It can go on my left side to do. I like I like to use edge weapons as a, as a weapon retention for my firearm tool. I can get to this. I like the grip of it. It's it's very similar to the, the handgun grip. It's also I can punch with it. Etc. Don't have to really think about it a whole lot. Here's some fixed blades. Alpha Knives made me these, uh, sent them to me. Alpha Knives down in Georgia, amazing guy. He's a BJJ black belt and makes some amazing products. But if you're going to have a knife, make sure you have the trainer. This is the trainer version. I like the Warncliffe design of the uh, edge here, the straight edge. But there's also something to be said for these hawkbills. I'll show you what I mean. In that these are self-defense designed, purposely built designed knives in that they cannot stab anybody. They are only to be used to, to slash and cut to defend yourself. Um, this is the Matriarch 2 by Spyderco. And I think it's based on the civilian. It's got the Emerson wave opener. So when you draw it out of your pocket, it, it opens. Emerson was, I mean, not Emerson. <laughs> Spotico was approached by the DEA, which is where this come from, and said, you know, we need to give something to our agents when they are not allowed to have a firearm because they're undercover, but that they can uh, use extremely lethally. So this is what Spotico come up with. It was actually the civilian now. That's the, the, the matriarch too. I also wanted to talk about there's a misunderstanding that, well, you see, Rich, this isn't lethal because this is such a small knife. And this is uh, one of Greg Elifert's last ditch knives, an amazing little tool. Uh, you can put that in your boot lace. And then when you need a knife, it's there hidden in your shoelaces. Or Rich, don't worry, pal, because you know what? I got I got the K-Bar Shark Bite. And the K-Bar Shark Bite, it's an all-plastic knife. It's a plastic sheath. Plastic knives, man, that, that can't be lethal. 
It is absolutely lethal. Uh, it is deadly force is the only context in which you can use a knife. So think about that. This is the knife I actually carried on three deployments and in combat. Uh, it is 100% lethal, but it also incorporates, like I said before, I don't want that knife used on me. I want to be the only one wielding that knife. Let's see what questions or comments we got. Thank you to the 36 folks that are still joining us. Let's see here. The Barrio, that's right, Gal says out there in the Philippines. Yeah, man, the Barrio was a dangerous place. Diego says, I have my daughter carrying a Maglite flashlight. That's, an, it, that's a not a bad idea. I like those big. When I was a bouncer uh, for ye, several years, I worked at uh, several different nightclubs, Mike Seeklander and I did. I carried a 3D cell mag light and a can of pepper spray. And that was all I had on my person. I didn't ever, as well as, you know, obviously a radio to call for backup. But yeah, you can do a lot with that. But again, if you look at like uh, the death of Malice Green, Malice Green, please take a look at it. Uh, two officers were attempting to arrest him. He was combative. One of them struck him in the head. Uh, Malice was had a lethal dose of chemicals in his body at the time. He was outside of a drug house. That one strike to the head ended up killing Ma Malice, or so the coroner said. It was probably the lethal dose of drugs that killed Malice, <clears throat> Mr. Malice Green. But Malice died, and those police officers, each of them had over 20 years, and they all went to prison and probably died there. So I, the idea with mag lights are, what are we doing with them? If we're striking with them and we strike somebody in the head with them, you might as well stab them in the face or shoot them in the head with a gun. It's a, It's the same thing. So we got to understand context in which you're used and how you're using them. But excellent point. Tony says, don't forget the old five cell mag lights. Oh yeah, they were, they were, they were awesome. Elke says, could also put your big watch in a, in a sock. Yeah. I love my tutor. Jeff says, what about the shank game? Yeah. The, the old shank game. Mm, watch out for that. You can have your elf on a shelf. I'll take my lock and a sock. Yeah. Gal says, I used coins and a sock before. Couldn't get a knuckle or a knife before. Yeah. Johnny says, field dressing a deer will make you appreciate the damage a knife can do 100%. Bill says, Scallywag makes some very nice knives, and most of them have trainers for them as well. Totally got to get that trainer, folks, and you got to train with it. Uh, John says, was that a Randall? I'm not sure, John. Okay, says uh, his name was Malice. Yeah, Malice Green. Look it up, folks. Terrible stuff. John says, I carried a, a Gerber Mark I in Desert Storm. Yeah, man, I believe that's what this is. That's a Gerber Mark II. Yeah. Yep, carried that on three deployments, including Desert Storm. So I love that knife. Uh, any questions about anything we've covered today? Let's kind of recap real quick over everything that we've gone over. We talked about understanding, you know, what is surviving the fight? How do we survive the fight physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, et cetera, financially, or, and we don't want to lose our freedom. That's how we survive it. We talked about understanding what winning is. I need to help someone choose another path other than to attack me. And we talked about, for those of you that didn't see it, you know, one of the ways we may do that is simply, all right, you know, breaking that mental paradigm of what they think they've bumped into. They see an old man put a mouthpiece in and say, let's go. Uh, maybe that makes them not want to fight anymore. Because you have been chosen and I need them to deselect me. I need them to change their mind. Then we talked about using the body as a weapon. Uh, in today's links, I've got a link to Bass Rutan some of his highlights. And I, I like, I like bass because the kicks are very simple. Mostly they're below the waist, but sometimes he does kick head kicks, um, heel palms to the face. Cause you don't want to, he doesn't want to break his hands and he punches to the body and knocks people out. And, uh, not to do a lot of war stories, but there was one time where, uh, when I was a bouncer, actually I was the doorman at club 108. Me and Mike Seeklander worked there together. And I, I did, I, Knocked a guy out with one body shot. So uh, I, I didn't think that would happen, but it absolutely did. So strikes to the liver. If you watch the video, you'll see Bass Rutan punishing people and knocking a lot of really good professional fighters out with just shots to the body. 
We talked about using the legs, arms, head, hands. We talked about Kazushi, that using your body to off-balance your opponent, and then using terrain as a weapon. Whether that's using gravity, using obstacles, placing things in between you and your subject, because remember, if they have to come around that object, what does it look like to everyone watching? And it's like, hey, man, that old guy, Rich Brown, he went behind the tree and the, the assailant kept coming after him. We talked about using our light as a self-defense weapon. We talked about using less lethal. We talked about using improvised weapons, everything from a rock to a lock and a sock to canes and umbrellas. What questions, if anything, do you have for me before I let you enjoy the rest of your Friday? If I had to pick one weapon, folks, it would probably be, if you're twisting my arm, it would probably be pepper spray. Because it's legal, I believe, in all 50 states, if you're over 18. It is the great equalizer. It doesn't leave any long-term harm, but you can watch plenty of videos on the on YouTube of people getting pepper sprayed, and they don't want to fight anymore. They will probably survive the encounter. They're marked permanently, or not permanently, but they're marked with UV marking dyes so that they can be uh, arrested later. I've used this dozens and dozens of times on dozens and dozens of people, not this specific Fox, but different. Never you actually never have used Fox mean green, but a big fan of it for various reasons. I already talked about before. Do you need to carry a knife? Absolutely. You need to carry enough. Do you need to carry a firearm? I think you do. Um, there's a lot of utility there, but please understand those are lethal force tools. What is your other force option? Please consider carrying pepper spray in one variety or another. Any final questions before we go today? Tony says when being pushed, pulled when being pulled, push. Yeah. Jay says Rick Hinderer puts out great pins and Kubitons worth looking at gents. Tough rider also puts out great defensive pins. I absolutely agree. Tough rider does. Uh, Mr. Michael Janich talks a lot about, Tough, tough rider and Kubitons. I have used them, but I've also used filled expedient Kubitons. As I mentioned before, you can use basically anything. Uh, a tough rider would be nice because these will tend to break. But something, if you know where the pressure points are on a human body, uh, radial nerves, etc., brachial, blah, blah, blah. You can do a lot of uh, interesting things with that if you are trained ahead of time. Johnny says public perception is a consideration in today's society. It really is. I've talked about optics before and people roll their eyes and like, Rich, you know, you're buying into this liberal crap. Guys, you got to understand the climate that we're in, man. Uh, you really do. You have a, you find a politically motivated district attorney that decides to take your case because you use something scary against a member of his community like, uh, like this. Oh my God. You know, he hit, that old Rich Brown hit someone uh, or two people with brass knuckles because this is something that this is a disparity of force. The minute I put this on, I'm not fighting anymore. The only time I would use this is with a disparity of force, multiple attackers, something like that. Uh, I could also, well, let's, and let's talk about this real quick because it's not something that we brought up in today's discussion. And that is that I believe 99% of the time the weapons are, are only designed to be felt. They're only designed to be felt. I, I don't want to brandish them. I don't want to try to scare people with them. I, I pull them out and use them. They're for me to know about and no one else. Um, because you can get into a lot of trouble pulling out your firearm and not using it. Uh, Andrew Brinko makes an excellent case when we've had him on the show that the minute you pull out the firearm and that person does something else, you change their behavior under the threat of force and coercion with that firearm. So you threaten them with deadly force. So please consider that. So I would rather use this in a way that it's felt. Now, another thing, this plastic knife, the shark bite, amazing tool. I don't, they may be illegal now or, or not being made anymore by a K bar. I'm not sure, but the, the all plastic knife is a, is a great idea. If you want to go non-permissive the way in which I use this, I, I don't normally uh, break the law, but sometimes I won't be disarmed. I'll leave it at that. If I'm going into a venue where the venue says I can't uh, carry, 
That's nice for the venue. I appreciate that. And they can ask me to leave if and when they find this on me. Uh, and I will politely leave. But it, it's something that uh, you need to decide for yourself if and when you're going to allow yourself to be uh, disarmed. Although I would make a case, as we've said on this show for the last six, seven years, you're never disarmed. Uh, and again, as the Supreme Court has reaffirmed uh, on multiple of cases, the quote I believe that they use is, and it may be in the Sixth District Court, I can't remember. I'm not a lawyer, folks. But they say, um, just because you're disarmed doesn't mean you're harmless. Bill says, whatever you get trained with it. Yeah, totally agree with that, Bill. John says, fights never go as planned. That's absolutely right. As John will probably know, Mr. Mike Tyson has a famous quote. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That is a fact. Guile says, as much as I want to stay, I need to go. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Stay warm. John says, weapon retention can be crucial. Outside 20 feet, it's your weapon. Inside 20 feet, it's a mutual weapon. I agree with that. You know, uh, Cecil Birch uh, over at Immediate Action Combatives, dear friend of mine, he has a saying. He says, you know, it doesn't matter who brought the weapon to the fight. It matters who controls the weapon in the fight. And that's true. And that's why, like I said, a lot of my things have lanyards on them. I want to be able to retain custody of that weapon or at least know how to retain custody of that weapon. So if you are a member of the American Warrior Society and you're watching this morning, we have some videos that are very simple techniques to maintain control or regain control of your firearm in an entangled fight. But what works for the firearm can also work for an edge weapon or an impact weapon. So if there are no final questions, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, Tony says gun-free zones are victim zones. Well said. Diego said monkey fist. I've never used one. I've never actually owned one. I know my brother has carried one. To me, I, instead of swinging a monkey fist, I'd rather use my hands to grapple. But, you know, that may be a, a, I'm a victim of what I've trained to do with my hands. Um, Jay says, great show, Rich. Thank you. Paul says, thanks. Great to hear from you today. John says, great show. Mark says, thanks, Rich. Have a great weekend. Guys, thank you for being a, being on with me this morning, being patient. I know Mike Seeklander and I had some difficulties at the front end of this show, but hopefully gave you some things to think about and ways that you can use these self-defense tools to keep you and your loved ones safer. And with that, folks, remember the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>